All right. So we released this report towards the middle, I think it was June 11th of 2011, did a lot of PR campaigning. I spent a lot of time up on the Hill with others, uh, talking with uh, congressmen and women to, to get some action behind this. And the Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee was put into play to really address the issues of research. What happened is, is in October of 2012, Uh, Howard Coe, the Assistant Secretary for Health, came to our meeting and he, in essence, unloaded this uh, recommendation 2.2 onto us. This is something we gave to their office and they did the great move. They gave it right back to us. And they said, you guys do this. And I'll share with you that I challenged Dr. Coe uh, in a very public forum about this because I thought that our system wasn't set up to really do this well. And I thought he did a brilliant job in addressing uh, that my challenge and the concerns. My concerns were that the IPRCC was really a group that was composed of high-level researchers, and our task was really to address research. But Dr. Coe, I thought, very appropriately said, listen, you know, we don't have the resources right now in HHS. We're dealing with uh, issues, of, they're dealing with issues of sequester. They're dealing with uh, uh, the uh, Obamacare issue, that it's either we get it done through the NIH, or we don't get it done for a while. And it's better to move now than not move at all. And I thought he was right. I thought he was, he was incredibly uh, insightful in this. So we put, together, we put together, as a consequence of this, this National Pain Strategy Task Force. Uh, we're still trying to come up with the acronym. It's either NPS or I'm kind of fond of NAPSTAF. We all have to have our acronyms. And so we have, an, we have then the following. We put together five working groups, and you'll note the overlap with these working groups fits perfectly with the Institute of Medicine report. We have uh, recently put together the most, uh, the most mature one is the professional education and training group that is going to be headed up by Matt Gallagher, who is a psychiatrist and uh, oversees a lot of the VA pain care, as well as um, Jim Rathmel, who is on uh, the main board ag agency for uh, physician care, excuse me, for physician credentialing. We put together a working group on public education and communication, one on population research, public health uh, prevention care and disparities, and public health services and reimbursement. And, and overriding all that, we have an oversight committee, an oversight group that uh, is co-chaired by Linda Porter, who is with NINDS, as well as myself. And so we're overseeing the operations of all of this. And we are all working very hard. This is all volunteer-based work. See if we can translate those Institute of Medicine recommendations into something that will lead to this cultural transformation in pain prevention, care, education, and research. We really are trying to help get out there and make a difference in this country uh, for that person who is suffering from pain. From an IOM perspective, we all recognize that uh, a couple of things. Not everybody needs comprehensive coordinated care. Let's face it. Again, it's going to start in the family. It's going to start with you know my father getting educated about how to deal with his arthritic conditions. It's going to get then advanced into uh, primary care, helping to teach them. But you know, it turns out that the majority of the numbers that we're dealing with with those healthcare expenses, and you guys have seen those numbers. It's about seventy-five percent of the healthcare expenses are taken up by what ten or fifteen percent of the patients, and it's those those unbelievably complicated patients that are burning up huge amounts of resources that are the real, the real problem, both for the patient, their families, but also from society. Those are the people that need comprehensive, coordinated, interdisciplinary care. And I have made it a, a life mission, if you will, to try to get some parity uh, with, with appropriate uh, reimbursement for that. Now, I'm taking, that's a different hat. I'm not wearing the IOM hat when I say that. That was a message that we put out from the IOM. I'm actually saying that as a Stanford Division Chief and also President Left for APM. Lynn Webster, who's the current president, feels very much the same. So we are starting to reach out to insurance payers to get them into the room to try to help them understand that this type of comprehensive care really does work. It really does work, and that we need to find ways of, uh, of paying for it. Uh, part of the problem is getting them to buy into the long term. A lot of them say, you know what, they're not in our network long enough for us to reap the benefits. So we have to get them past that point. 
and where it's all going to go with uh, accountable care, boy, oh boy, that's a, you know that, is that, that's anybody's guess, right? But uh, we, we hope that it will actually reach the parity you mentioned. Other questions, other thoughts? It's clearly going to require this. You know, we use this old tagline, cultural transformation, if you will, because we have developed into a society, as, as we all know, that uh, it's much easier just to take the pill, right? And it's going to come about clearly through educating, educating the public that that pill has untoward consequences, but it's also starting to get at the primary care level. When I talk with the primary care docs, they want more tools. And I am seeing them, quite frankly, to give credit to primary care. They are starting to integrate this into their programs. I'm seeing more and more wellness programs being introduced, uh, more and more uh, physical fitness, more and more education programs. They clearly recognize the value of it. And you have to give them credit when they're only given five or ten minutes to see a patient. I mean, we have a luxury. We get, I get an, almost an hour and a half to see a patient you know, with our fellows at, uh, at Stanford Pain Center and a half an hour for a follow-up. I mean, the primary care docs would love that. Um, but it is going to require that, uh, that entire shift in the way we think about things. I'll, I'll share with you, I may be a little Pollyannish. I'm already starting to see the inklings of that shift. I'm starting to see the American public, I think, appreciate more and more about the things that you folks do and the integration in with their, uh, uh, with their overall uh, medical, psychological, and social health. Yeah, absolutely. And I wear, um, I wear yet another hat, and that is on the California Department of Workers' Compensation, uh, MEAC panel that writes the guidelines. So I helped co-author the, the last set of guidelines that we put out for the MEAC and MTUS. And in that, you know, we moved over from the ACOM guidelines to, uh, in this case, the ODG, but you know, I helped author, I you know, wrote a large part of the introduction with a number of other people to that MTUS, and we put in there all of the things that you guys push really hard. Uh, we just got done doing the opioid guidelines that are going to go up to public commentary, uh, integrating in a lot of the knowledge and understanding, the basic tenets of what you do. And then we're cir I'm circling back around right now, and I have to have it reported by December, to ultimately revise the chronic pain guidelines that we hope will have a better impact in the Ahmed approach. So yes, we'd all like it to move like this. Uh, and it's taken years. There was a long gap here in California between when we put out the MTUS guidelines and when we reinvigorated the, uh, the MEAC. But I, I think it's active, and I encourage you guys when the public commentary periods open up on these guidelines, you know, to, to weigh in. You know, let your voices be heard because we do listen. I think the biggest barrier uh, that I see is at a, uh, it, it, it's all about or it's not all about the money, it's mostly about the money. <laughs> so, you know, when I went up on, I, I, John, I may be getting to your question, and if I'm not, you, you challenged me on it. Um, when I went up on the, the hill and I started talking with uh, congressmen and congresswomen and their staffers, they really don't want to hear about new programs because all they're trying to do is cut money. You know, they got to find ways to cut it because they can't afford putting new discretionary spending into it. And so what I tried to work hard to do was reframe this by, you know, a little bit of the ounce of prevention gets you a pound of cure, that ultimately we can save kajillions of dollars, billions of dollars, if we intervene early, um, if we apply some of these basic concepts and treatments that are really not very expensive, you know, we can make a, a big, big strike. Those are where I see right now the biggest, biggest barriers, is getting people to understand up on the hill uh, that we need to do a little bit of an investment, maybe a little bit of a shifting in, uh, in how the money is distributed. For a lot of you who are on the front lines doing pain treatment services, you can appreciate that a lot of the stuff that the, uh, the committee found are things that we can relate to in our own practices. You know, you, you look at the guidelines, you look at the recommendations, you're like, well, that makes a lot of sense. It's nothing that's not obvious to us. But what's pivotal about the work that Dr. Mackey and the committee did is that this information is going to the policymakers. It's going to the people who have the power to create changes um, in healthcare throughout this country. And so it really is an honor to have had Dr. Mackey, who was one of the authors on that report, present to us. Uh, so again, thank you, Sean, for talking to us.